Welcome to worship and thank you for inviting us into your home. I'm Kip Rosen, one of the pastors here. We are on week two of our new series that we called Church Fails. We're looking at some of the ways that the church has missed the mark as we try to follow Jesus. That is, we fall short of the ideal of being the body of Christ. That is, the church is not perfect because it's full of imperfect people. And in this series, we're attempting to recognize our failures as a church and acknowledge the harm we've caused by some of the things that we've done or some of the things we've failed to do. And last week, Pastor Matt kicked off the series with, by talking about how church fails when we, we don't engage in difficult or uncomfortable conversations and topics. And he shared some stats on how the church in the United States is in decline. Put simply, 65 million adults in the United States who grew up going to the church have dropped out of active attendance and about 2.7 million more are leaving the church each year. There are a lot of different reasons why people have left. The, the Barna Group released a study citing five compelling reasons why church attendance continues to dwindle, especially among millennials. One reason is the, the church is viewed as irrelevant. Leaders are hypocritical and leaders have experienced too much moral failure. I know that's three reasons all stuffed into one, but the Barna Group study puts all those reasons together in one reason. Another reason is God is missing in the church. People go to church looking, but have difficulty finding God. A third reason, they're not learning about God. People come to church seeking God only to not understand anything they've heard. The church lacks clarity sometimes. Fourth reason is they're not finding community. The study points out, despite a growing epidemic of loneliness, only 10% report going to church to find community. While the early church exploded in growth because they were a great community that loved each other and loved the world. Well, finally, the fifth reason from the Barna study of why church attendance continues to decline is legitimate doubt is prohibited. And this is the church fail we're going to focus on today. The church fails when honest questions and doubts are not allowed. And the truth is, in many churches, it's very difficult to have an, to have an honest conversation about doubts. In many conservative churches, legitimate questions get dismissed as uh, trite or they get dismissed with pat answers. And in many liberal churches, there's often so much ambiguity that questions that actually can be answered are left unresolved. So, People feel like they're getting nowhere. So people leave the church because they have these honest questions, they have doubts, and they don't feel like the church is open to conversation or interested in it. In some cases, people have felt shamed or criticized for asking these questions. And some leave because they feel, if I'm gonna to come to church, I've gotta shut my brain off, I can't think. The church fails when we fail to allow questions and doubt. And the church, that is all of us, leaders, members, friends, all of us simply have to get better at handling the tension that comes with questions and with doubts. Now, I know some people might be listening to this and thinking, well, is it really okay to have questions and doubts if we're true followers of Jesus? I mean, what do those doubts do to our faith? Can we ask those questions? For instance, is it okay if I don't believe in a literal six-day creation of the world? Or what if I don't believe in a particular stance the United Methodist takes on a social issue? Do I have to read the Bible literally? Can our teenagers ask tough questions about the Bible and about life? Now, as, as a way to think about the question of whether it's all right to question and doubt, I want you to listen to the story of Jacob wrestling with someone or something. Listen for what you think this story says about whether it's okay to question, to doubt. This is from Genesis chapter 32. It says, The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took, with them, he took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? 
And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called that place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. And the sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. This has always been an intriguing story for me, Jacob wrestling with a man or an angel or God. Was it God face to face? Peniel means face of God. Well, I'm going to invite you to consider this image of God, uh, Jacob struggling with God as a metaphor for the doubts and questions of faith that we struggle with. Have you ever felt like you were wrestling with God through a long night? I'm going to suggest it's okay to struggle with God about the questions of faith and life. In the story, Jacob is exhausted from the struggle, but his wrestling, it leads to a blessing in his life. He has seen God face to face. He receives a new identity, a new name, Israel. You know what that name means, Israel? It means fighter of God. Jacob fought with God all night. It wasn't easy, but it resulted in a new name and a blessing. And he might have left with a limp, but he encountered God face to face. He wrestled with God. Well, some people are uncomfortable doing that with questions and doubts and wrestling with God. And I know the church hasn't always appreciated doubters and questioners. I ran across a book during my sermon prep this week entitled Faith After Doubt by Brian McLaren. I ordered the book, haven't had a chance to read it, but I did listen to three conversations McLaren had with various groups about the book, about faith, and about doubt. And his contention, which I wholeheartedly agree with, is that doubt is not the enemy of faith. However, pretending that you do not have doubts, that is the enemy of faith because hypocrisy and pretense don't fit with a healthy faith. So doubt is not the enemy of faith, but doubt is the enemy of authoritarianism. And that just might be one reason why it's okay to raise questions and have doubts. In fact, it might be a very good reason to have these conversations in the church. And McLaren gives this example of how our doubts can actually lead to maturity and growth. If we go back 500 years, every Christian in Europe woke up in a universe where the earth was the center of the universe and there's 10 concentric spheres around the earth. They believed that these spheres were made of crystal, 10 spheres, and God was on the outside, and the universe is kind of literally like an aquarium with God looking in. And it was a universe where these spheres moved around the earth. And while it's hard to imagine that universe, uh, with just the bit I've described, it's sort of a cozy picture. It's defined, it's absolute. There's an up and there's a down. There's a center of things and humans are at the center of things. And because the church is very important, the church is at the center of the universe. And imagine having that view of the universe and your view of God is connected to that view of the universe for all of Christian history up until the 1400s. And in the 1400s, Copernicus comes along and he says, hey, I'd like to make a slight tweak to your model of the universe, right? He questions and doubts the universe, that model. The earth is no longer the center of the universe, he says. So maybe you can understand why some years later when Galileo comes along and says, yeah, Copernicus was right, I'm gonna give you evidence for it. The church said, uh, Galileo, come on down to Rome. Um, we'd like to have a talk with you. And they threatened him with prison and with torture and so on. And we as Protestants can't take any pride because both Martin Luther and John Calvin bitterly mocked Copernicus for daring to question what everybody knew was true. So you can see that if our view of God is all wrapped up with a view of the universe a certain way and then you doubt that view of the universe, what do you do with your view of God? Your old concept of God is shattered. Can you, can you believe in the God anymore and when the universe isn't this simple, elegant shape? But think what's happened now. Now our understanding of the universe, scientists argue whether there is 100 or 250 billion galaxies. Imagine that. The universe is expanding, and none of, none of that was ever imagined in those days. So, so now the universe is so much bigger. 
And whatever God is now, we have to take God into account in relationship to this new universe that we understand. And McLaren says, now I'll just tell you for me, whatever God is, God is a lot bigger and more interesting than just the keeper of an aquarium. So you could say it's a huge gain when we're willing to doubt some of those ideas and let our concepts of what the universe is and what life is to allow those to change. And however God fits into that now, it's, we've got to adjust. Doubt is not the enemy of faith. It can lead to truth. It can lead to growth and maturity. Another example, you know, 500 years ago, what we would call mental illness, it was attributed to the devil. So tens of thousands of women across Europe were arrested, tortured, and killed as witches. And interestingly, many of them were at the age of what we would call paramenopause, so that maybe they were having menopausal symptoms, and without the benefit of medications and hormone therapy and things we have, those women were simply killed as witches. And you think, thank God somebody started <laughs> doubting that understanding. If we hadn't doubted the old explanation, we'd never have become more humane. And then you can just kind of keep pushing that forward. For example, when I was young, people who are part of the LGBTQ community, they were considered to have mental illness, right? That's been almost, it's been almost 50 years since homosexuality was removed from, from uh, being a mental uh, disorder. So you think, if people had not been willing to doubt that and question that, and of course some people probably still do believe it, they don't doubt it, but because people raised questions and doubts, we get a chance to become more humane. We can become more Christ-like in the way we treat one another, in the way we understand one another. You know, today old assumptions are being challenged in almost every area of life. And that includes our faith, it includes our religion. But if we live constructively with doubt, we can leave behind unnecessary baggage, we can seek the truth, and we can commit to what matters most in life. Doubt is not the enemy of faith, but it can be a doorway, a doorway to a more mature and fruitful kind of faith. You probably remember the story of the disciple Thomas Thomas doubts the resurrection of Jesus in John 20. He says, I won't believe it unless I see the nail prints in his hands, put my fingers in them and put my hand in the wound in his side. I won't believe it if I don't see it, if I don't touch it. And as a result, Thomas has forever gone down in history as doubting Thomas. The Bible doesn't say that, we say that. The guy who doubted the resurrection. And Jesus sort of chastises him following his sudden change of heart upon seeing the risen Christ. Jesus says, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. That's from John 20. Thomas, upon seeing Christ, had let go of his doubt and chose to believe only to receive kind of this cold shoulder from Jesus, his, his Lord and his God, as, as Thomas proclaimed. And now some read this as Jesus saying to believers everywhere, do not doubt. If you doubt, your faith is worse worth less than someone who never doubts. So for some people, those words become sort of a stumbling block to faith. But now to be fair, the words are meant to encourage people who have not seen and yet uh, can come to believe the resurrection even though they haven't seen it with their eyes. You can believe even though you did not witness it personally. However, the words have been used to admonish those who, who dare to question Jesus' resurrection, let alone any matter of faith. The message often taught in, in church Sunday schools to our children is don't ask questions. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Unfortunately, that message can hinder the growth of those who have honest questions to ask. Doubting Thomas. But don't forget where Thomas, the so-called doubter, don't forget where that doubt led him. He may or may not have questioned the resurrection. However, he did without question go to India to preach the good news of a risen Lord. And it was there, thousands of miles away from home, he was martyred for Jesus. His body lays at rest at Mylapore, India. Thomas's doubt 
Let him to grow into a great preacher of hope and healing and wholeness, witnessing to the risen Lord and Savior. Doubt is not the enemy of faith. It can open a doorway to a more fruitful and mature kind of faith. So embrace your doubt, ask the tough questions, and allow the risen Christ to appear to you. Then it becomes real for you. Jesus does not admonish you for your doubts. Instead, he calls you to embrace them, to rise above them, grow beyond them. God doesn't ask us to pretend that we have certainty. I mean, when you read the Bible, you can see all sorts of people who had questions, who had doubts, who had fears. God accepted them where they were and called them to step forward in faith, step forward through the doubt, step forward in the doubt. I, I like how the theologian and author Frederick Buechner put it. He, he wrote, whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you don't have any doubts, you are either kidding yourself or asleep. And he goes on to say, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. I like that. Doubt is the ants in the pants of faith. I like that. Let me leave you with this. It happened right before Jesus gave the Great Commission to send his disciples out into the world after his resurrection. It's a big moment, uh, to say the least. And these are the last words used to describe the disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. This is the last glimpse of the men who followed Jesus for three years, who learned from him, who saw him crucified, who saw him resurrected. Here's, here's what it says in Matthew. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but, some doubted. That's Matthew 28, 16, and 17. I find that amazing. The doubts are still present. And Matthew does not hide it from us like, well, let's just keep quiet about those disciples' doubts. He puts it right there in the gospel. And in the face of those disciples' doubts, what does Jesus say next? It says, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And he says, surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. That's in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus didn't say, well, now once you're absolutely certain, I want you to go. No, he, he looks at those worshiping, doubting friends and says, you go. You doubters, I want you to go. Go tell the world the good news about me, the very news that you are doubting. Go, get up and go. Tell the world, and I'll go with you. Maybe you'll have new doubts along the way, but Jesus says, I will be with you to the end of the age. You see, disciples are not people who never doubt. They doubt and worship. They doubt and serve. They doubt and help each other with their doubts. Let us at Asbury be a community where everyone can be open about our faith and open about our doubts. And just think what a gift that would be in the midst of it all. Certainty that the risen Christ is with us. Now, as we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus today, the one who calls us and sends us, even with our doubts, with our questions, with our uncertainties, we're, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, remembering that Christ is with us to the ends of the age. So I want you to have a piece of bread. I invite you to get a piece of bread and have some juice ready to share as we remember that Jesus' body was broken, that his life was poured out for each one of us. Let us pray. O gracious God, holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, our light and our salvation. I'm grateful to you, O God, that Jesus is with us to the ends of the age, even with our doubts. And I'm grateful that Jesus knows our struggles, he knows our questions, and even as he cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
It's a reminder that he knows the questions that we ask. I thank you, O oh God, that by the baptism of Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on the gifts of bread and wine that we share. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. We feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to share the body and the blood of Christ, remembering that the risen Christ is with you. Amen.